Forget the apple. I'll take a hot dog any day. That's this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. The Big Apple, New York City. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 99. You know, Frank always said, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Well, obviously, the world's auto manufacturers believe that because at this year's New York Auto Show, there were no fewer than 12 world premieres. And, you know, people were talking about the cars, but they were also talking about the Nissan Motor Company, a company that is $16 billion in debt, a company that was just thrown a lifeline by Renault, and a company that is gaining a reputation for building great cars that nobody wants to buy. We are going to have lunch in a few minutes. We got the check from Renault this morning, so we're springing for lunch. But we have a little more fun. Uh, this has been a hell of a ride for the last few months. We started and the ride is not over yet, and it could get bumpy. Although Renault paid over $5 billion for a 37% stake in Nissan, many are calling it a huge risk for the French automaker. Renault comes into this process after just being profitable for the last two years itself. So. You're asking a company that's just barely getting its feet on the ground to come in and help another company which doesn't have its feet on the ground yet. And, you know, Nissan's future is really up in the air. Although Nissan will not disclose its debt load, some analysts believe it could be close to $30 billion, if not more. The world premiere of the i30 from Nissan's Infiniti Luxury Division is just one of many new models introduced this year by Nissan. The popular Maxima has a new look and more power. The Pathfinder is still a bread and butter vehicle for the company, along with the brand new Xterra and a new Frontier pickup with a crew cab body style. All quality vehicles. So what's the problem? Nissan always had great cars, they're handling well, they're driving well. The problem is probably a lack of spirit. Uh, in a market which is so crowded, you need a car that gets out of what's ordinary. What they're missing is really, really exciting design. You know, the kinds of products that come to the marketplace and people say, oh wow, I gotta have that. And when they drive it, they just write the check. They have been designed the cars they think people want in North America. I don't know necessarily they have got the cars that people do want. Um, maybe they should let their stylist uh, be turned loose and bring out something a little more daring, a little more thought-provoking. They need something jazzy. Product's all important in the car market, and, and these new products are very important to us. But they're also the right products. They're not desperation moves at all. These are products that have been under development for, for three or four years. We've really thought them through. We've talked to consumers. We've looked at research. We've tested these cars. So we know they're the right products, and they're not a, um, any kind of desperation effort. In the car business, that's what you want. Success comes from having really good products, and we know that these are really going to help us. They know how to put together the cars. The problem is, what's on top just doesn't excite the marketplace. So you get a car like a Nissan Maxima, which is a great car to drive, um, and yet it's a fairly, fairly staid styling. There's lots of brands and lots of products out there, but if you build products that are true, that have a really clear um, uh, stance or a clear uh, idea behind them and you can communicate that, people will understand it and they'll react positively to it. Pathfinder is a prime example of that, so is Maxima. So those are vehicles where people understand them, they're true to themselves, and they will come, they will, they will buy, and they will enjoy. The most important development for Nissan would be to have a product that would be a home run. Because when you have one product that is a home run, it opens a window of opportunity. People are willing to give you more of a chance. And you can then 
building that momentum and rebuilding your brand. We won't build it! That home run could be found in Nissan's past with the announcement that the Z concept car will go into production. It's a central issue for Nissan because one of the things this company is known best for is its ability to build performance cars. Now the performance car market has almost gone away at one point, it's beginning to come back. But for this to score, for this to work right, it would have to be under $25,000 and it would have to be soon. The sooner the better for the home run. There's so many products coming out that it's very important that the messages be focused and the company be responsive to a product that is a home run. The Renault will be probably a welcome sight because uh, Renault has this experience in making excitement in Europe. They're renowned to make exciting product, different product. Uh, the thing I hope is that they'll put their design uh, masters behind that so Nissan can put their manufacturing power, uh, which they have, which they're very good at, and Renault can put his knowledge of excitement and well done, exciting car to really push ahead with Nissan. They don't have that, and until they really revamp the whole product lineup, they are going to struggle in the marketplace because keep in mind, you know, it's nice to say we got something new coming, we got something new coming. Everybody's got something new coming every year. Why Nissan? Well, that's a pretty good question. I might just have a pretty good answer coming up later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, not only will this thing hold seven in relative comfort, if you fold the second and third row seats flat, you can hold 88 cubic feet of cargo and you get roughly seven feet of almost flat floor. You know there's always been a fairly large hole in the sport utility market. You want something larger than a compact ute, but you don't want to drive a land yacht. Well the Durango fits that bill perfectly, because it will accommodate seven in comfort, and yet it's small enough to be manageable in our cramped urban surroundings. Durango is decidedly truck-like in execution. Indeed, the Dodge Dakota formed the basis for the new Durango. The body-on-frame construction is a straight lift with a few modifications. Modifications that make a world of difference. For instance, the frame is no less than three times stiffer than the trucks. Most of the additional stiffness is found in the fully boxed frame rail and two extra cross members. The latter contribute enormously to the overall torsional rigidity, eliminating many of the usual rattles and creaks. The suspension features double wishbones, torsion bars, gas charge shocks and a sway bar up front, while traditional single stage leaf springs, gas shocks and a sway bar make up the rear suspension. The combined effects mean the Durango does not mandate the use of a kidney belt to endure the off-road ride. The only anomaly is the feel imparted by the steering. It's too light and vague to the feel, meaning you're forced to dial in many minor corrections to maintain a straight line on the highway. Beneath the hood, Durango offers three engine choices. The base unit is a 175 horse 3.9 litre V6 that produces 225 pounds feet of torque. If you intend to put the Durango to work, the 5.2 litre V8 is the unit of choice. It lifts the horsepower to 230 and the torque to a massive 300 pounds feet at just 3,200 RPM. For those that need to haul around a small house on a regular basis, take the 245 horsepower 5.9 liter V8. It delivers 335 pounds feet of torque, and when properly equipped, this monster will haul a 7,200 pound trailer with the greatest of ease. Off-road, that low-end grunt makes easy work of very steep inclines. Obviously, the premium for this power is found in the fuel economy numbers. 19.2 litres per 100 kilometres in the city and 12.8 on the highway. Matched with any of these engines is a four-speed automatic transmission and a part-time transfer case that features two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive high and of course four low. Would you believe this? 
$44,000 for this truck and anti-lock brakes are an option. It's true you do get rear ABS, but come on Chrysler, give us consumers what we want. A full ABS package that's standard. Stopping power is standard Dodge, meaning front discs and rear drums. The stops are easily modulated, the feel and effort required are well within acceptable limits, as are the stops measuring 118 feet from 80k. As with the exterior styling, the front seat environment is a straight lift from the Dakota pickup, meaning all the primary controls fall readily to hand. The instrumentation is complete legible and thankfully analog. And even the audio equipment comes off the top shelf with a choice of a number of fine sounding units. According to Dodge, there are two very different types of SUV buyer. The first group, well, they treat their vehicle more as a luxury car and are therefore interested in image. The other group, well, they're the practical-minded sort that look for their vehicle to earn its keep. Now, that's exactly where this Durango is aimed. In aiming this vehicle down that particular road, Dodge could put a very different spin on the highly competitive SUV market. It's time to wrap up our long-term Volkswagen Passat, and with the exception of a flat tire, the result of a very rusty nail, we've had nothing but driving pleasure over the past six months and about 15,000 kilometers. Like the Jetta, the Passat has picked up styling cubes from its big brothers, the Audi A6 and A4. The result? A sportier look, plenty of room inside, and a huge trunk. Our test vehicle comes equipped with the standard 1.8 turbocharged four-cylinder engine with 150 horsepower. The transmission is a five-speed automatic with a manual shifting mode. A couple of pet peeves, the cup holder, well, it's useless. And if you go with the standard cloth, stay away from this color. It shows up every speck of dirt. So, would we recommend buying the new Passat? You bet. One suggestion though, this four-cylinder with the manual transmission is smooth and quiet, but I suggest taking the V6 for a spin, especially if you're going to be carrying a full load. Other than that, you've got yourself a lively sports sedan with even a little bit of European character. There's nothing wrong with that. I see the future of Mitsubishi. We're calling this the SSU, it's the Super Sports Utility. Basically, it's inspired by military aircraft, high-speed trains, uh, Indy cars. It took four months to get it to where it is now. It's a fully drivable vehicle. There's a V6 VR4 engine in it, twin turbo, 310 horsepower, uh, all-wheel drive all the time. We're trying to think of it as a high-performance uh, rally car that seats five people and all their gear. They've driven this car off-road uh, up some, some pretty steep inclines, and uh, it's pretty exciting. Our whole design team just really put it together and just came up with something that really works, came out great. Seeing the, the final car standing there, fully finished, uh, having seen the, the initial sketches uh, from some of our designers and seeing it carried all the way through into the final product, then actually driving it, it's the most fun that I can have. Well, this is a great opportunity to gauge the public's reaction on what they think of this car, whether or not they'd like to buy it. So far, the, the, the reactions have been overwhelming, and uh, we're hoping to push it into production due to that reaction. Our Midas tip of the week concerns vibration. This tip only applies to front-wheel drive vehicles. If you have such a vehicle and you have a violent vibration under acceleration with the vehicle road speed above about 40 kilometers, suspect a worn out inner CV joint. That's this one right here. This end of the joint splines into the transmission and it allows it to plunge in and out as the uh, ride height of the vehicle changes. And out here at the outer end, the outer CV joint allows the front wheel to turn left and right. When these joints become worn out, you get a violent vibration. You can confirm this by lifting your foot off the accelerator. If the vibration completely goes away at the same road speed, you've almost certainly confirmed a worn inner CV joint. We're going to re remedy that situation by putting a reconditioned or rebuilt shaft in the vehicle. It's had the, both joints completely reground and oversized bearings put in, new boots and new grease. It's the proper way to fix such a situation. That's your Midas tip of the week. 
While you're out cruising cyberspace, why not pull into MotoringTV.com? MotoringTV.com is best viewed with autopilot by Romulan and can be downloaded right from our site. Uh, the good old days in the drive-in theater. And I say good old days because they're hard to find these days. But you know, one of my favorite drive-in stories is how some young people, yours truly not included, used to sneak in their friends by putting them in the trunk of the car. Then they'd wait till it got dark and hopefully your friends would come and let you out. But if you had the new 2000 Taurus back then, you wouldn't have that problem because it comes with this new feature. It's a release toggle inside the trunk. But you know, in reality, this feature hopefully is a solution to what is becoming a very serious and sometimes tragic situation. There was a night in 1995 that Jeanette Fennel will never forget. Masked gunmen abducted Jeanette and her husband and locked them in the trunk of their car. I pulled out all the upholstery, ripped at anything I could that was inside of the trunk of our car. Soon after their ordeal, the Fennels started Trunk Releases Urgently Needed Coalition, or Trunk. Its mission is to pursue a greater level of public safety by making sure car trunks are escapable. At this point, we have uncovered over a thousand victims who have been locked in the trunk of a car. Now 20 to 25 percent of those people die. So we want to be a strong voice for those victims that just say, you know, if I had a little button or just a pull string, anything, that would have made the difference between life and death. Just pull down on the handle for anyone who happens to be trapped in the trunk. Uh, that will release the latch and the trunk will pop open. The material we're using for the handle is a glow-in-the-dark phosphorescent plastic uh, that will glow even when it's exposed to only a very short uh, period of ambient light. Now General Motors was the first company to come up with this feature, but it is an option. But GM tells me that like Ford, it will soon become original equipment. All right, now let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. This week I want to talk about starter motors, that little electric motor that lives underneath your engine and cranks over that great big engine on a really cold morning with relative ease. Now here's the location of the starter motor on most vehicles. There is the odd vehicle where you can see the starter motor from the under hood area, but in most cases you're going to be underneath the vehicle like we are right now in order to view the starter motor. Now in just about all cases they're bolted to the engine or transmission right where the engine and transmission intersect because the starter pinion, the small gear inside the starter, has to mesh with this great big ring gear that we refer to uh, that is on the flex plate or flywheel of the engine. Now those two mesh when you turn the key and it allows the starter motor to crank the engine over. Now I've uh, hooked up a jumper wire to this starter motor so that I can get it to crank uh, from underneath here. And that's what's going to happen when you turn the key in the morning. Starter pinion intersects with this ring gear, cranks the engine over. Now I've moved the, the uh, inspection cover aside so that you could see this area here. And that's exactly what happens when you crank that thing over in the morning. Here's a typical starter motor we've, we've removed from the car, mounted in the vise, and I've hooked it up to a battery over here via some booster cables. Now when I hook up my jumper wire to this one, you're going to see the starter motor engage. That's what it would do in the car. The starter pinion kicks forward and engages with this area here where our, where our flywheel is located, and it would begin to crank the engine over. Now, in order to do that, the solenoid up here has a lot to do with that. It, it not only electrically connects the uh, battery to the starter motor, but in this case, it also mechanically kicks the starter drive into engagement with the flywheel. Now, in most cases, the, the uh, solenoid is either integral or mounted on the starter in this fashion, with the exception of Ford products, which are mounted remotely on the fender. Now, down inside the front of the starter here is this assembly here we refer to as the drive or pinion assembly. There's the pinion gear meshing with the flywheel, and there's an overrunning clutch in this assembly that allows it to freewheel in one direction and lock up in the other, so that if you accidentally forget to or release the key once the engine's going, you won't overspeed and destroy the starter. Now, in this area here, the starter motor is basically just a 12-volt DC electric motor with brushes, bushings, field coils, etc. Everything you'd expect to find in an electric motor. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99.
few months ago, I got a chance to ride with Dr. Ferdinand Pieck, who's the chairman of Volkswagen Worldwide. Now, Pieck is always talking about our Japanese friends, and I asked him who among the Japanese companies did he think was the best. He said, well, Toyota's got the best quality, and Nissan was number two. I was a bit surprised by that, and I asked him, what about Honda? He said, well, the Honda driver is a more sporting driver and is more forgiving of his cars. By implication, Nissans, which are a little on the bland side, have to be perfect or the customer's out the door. The fact is, the people who own Nissans love them to death. But people who don't own Nissans don't tend to put them on the shopping list. I mean, a guy who owns a Camry, he might give an Accord a shot. Somebody who's happy with a Civic might try a Corolla next time. But does the Altima or Maxima ever sort of appear to them? Probably not. Another problem that they face is that they're building cars on 29 platforms worldwide. So they've come up with this incredibly expensive system called the Intelligent Body Assembly System, or IBAS. This computerized module can build front-wheel drive cars, rear-wheel drive cars, big cars, small cars, but it's very expensive. So it's the right answer to the wrong question. It's not a function of building cars on 29 platforms. The question is, how do we get the number of platforms down to four? which is what Volkswagen builds four and a half million cars on. Now, Renault has recently purchased a big chunk of Nissan, and maybe the combination of Gallic design flair with Nissan's engineering and production capabilities, maybe that's what's going to save them. But frankly, I don't think they've ever recovered North America from changing the name from Datsun to Nissan. I'm Jim Kenzie. Even though you can never find one when you want one, there sometimes appears to be more cabs in Manhattan than cars. Now in the good old days they drove checker cabs, then they turned to the Caprice. But when that model bit the dust they turned to Ford product like the Crown Victoria. But recently the New York City taxi company purchased 500 Honda Odysseys on an experimental basis. How's that experiment going? We hope to tell you on a future program. That's it for now. We'll be back next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Uh, you've got to break through the clutter somehow so that people turn their head, wow, what was that, you know? And look at that, that's really nice. And the Thunderbird breaks through the clutter. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.